it's not just building these protocols to help with certain symptoms. Okay. It's not just building protocols to help to, you know, get pregnant or avoid mold toxicity or, or get rid of mold toxicity or fix your gut. We're talking about life changing results now and in the future. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Doc Jock Show. So today I feel called to talk about this particular topic. And the reason I feel called to do this is because, you know, through through this these years of my training, I have evolved quite a bit as a clinician. You know, my, my journey was when I came out here, you know, when I came out of school, I was strict chiropractic, right? Switched from chiropractic and doing chiropractic and some functional medicine. Trained with some people that uh, claimed that they knew everything. They knew nothing, especially with where I'm at right now. And I have been slowly accumulating more and more knowledge from the naturopathic realm, from the traditional Chinese uh, medicine realm, from the functional medicine realm, from the chiropractic realm, and basically been able to merge this all together. And then we bring it to the present. This is where we're seeing a lot more of an integration to adding in spiritual work or soul work. After COVID came and, and did its thing, you know, I, we say that there was a great awakening that, that took place. And this isn't political. I'm saying from, from like a happiness standpoint, like some people realize, hey, I'm in a relationship that's terrible right now and I don't like it. I'm out. So divorce rate went out, right? Because it forced us to be in tight quarters for a long period of time. And if you don't know how to communicate with your spouse, the band-aid was ripped off and, and the weakness was exposed. So therefore, the end result of that is you guys are done, right? So as I'm going through and I'm training, and I'm doing all my things. I mean, if you listen to anything I said, the body is going to be categorized into really three main organ systems or groups. And we're going to have the neuroendocrine, so the adrenal and the hormones, we're going to have the GI and we're going to have the detoxification pathways. Everything that you can experience on a daily, weekly, monthly, lifely basis is typically going to fit into those three main categories. Right? And the inflammation is going to trigger it. We're going to have catabolic physiology where things break down, push into insulin resistance, and then we're going to get ourselves some oxidative damage or oxidative stress. So when we can quantify this into smaller groups, it makes it a lot easier to correct. And it also makes it really easy as a clinician because I don't really have to worry about much. I don't treat disease states. I, I treat based off of your lifestyle, your diet, and, and what's going on with what shows on a test. And I thought that was really all I had to do, right? When we're like, oh, we're going to coach you on diet. We're going to coach you on lifestyle. And then I'm like, wait a second. There's this, this, like, this subclinical stress that people are feeling. And some people aren't ready to let it out. Some people aren't ready to fully experience what they're going through. And so what I wanted to do here in this, in this podcast, in this episode, is really kind of like give a little bit more insight on what it is that I actually do. And yes, the functional medicine, the naturopathic stuff, the traditional, all of that still applies. And it's still a huge root in what I do. But what I was noticing was that when we were starting to remove any physical ailments, whether that's, hey, I just have low back pain, or I've got a hypothyroid, or I've got PCOS, or irritable bowel, or colitis, or cancer, or whatever it is that we work with, what we would find is after we would fix the physical, the mental would display itself. And men, so I'm not saying that people went crazy after they, <laughs> they did protocols. What I'm saying is that they were no longer distracted by the physical ailment. Now, there's two categories of people in this. One is, is that person who's so afraid to change. that the, They're the victim. They, they need to cling on to that identity because they don't know what else is out there for them. So that identity is crucial for them. Okay. And then you have the person who didn't even know, right? It was subclinical, subconscious. They didn't even know that these traumas were there. And then as we correct the physical, then all of a sudden you're like, wait a second. I have never been happy in a relationship. I, I've never loved myself. I, I'm still carrying around abuse from when I was a child. Or they go through something and they're like, I had an awakening. And I think, 
I think something happened to me when I was a child and I, and I, I wasn't aware of it and I, I don't know, but it, I had a dream this happened and I talked to my mom or I talked to my dad and it, it was confirmed it's true and, and I didn't even know that, right? And these, these functional medicine groups that are out there and these functional medicine docs that are out there, they don't understand the intricacies here, right? And I came to this realization over the weekend, I was talking to, to my wife, Maggie, and I'm like, you know, I'm not like, you can't put me in a box. <laughs> I try, I try to come out with my own label, if you will, a naturopathic health expert, but still that doesn't, that doesn't really quantify what I do. I'm a healer and I, I heal through ha- helping you to heal yourselves. I have the tools. I have the tool belt. I have every skill necessary or the people necessary to refer to, to be able to crack open your code and make you the best version of yourself. And these, these, these groups are like, okay, let's talk about stress. Let's talk about testing the adrenals. Let's talk about, you know, your physical stress and they just focus on workouts or they just focus on diet and like, great, that's awesome. It's going to help. Don't get me wrong. I'm not downplaying it at all. It's freaking crucial. Your diet has to be on point. It has to be great. All right, because what you put in your body is what we make energy from. Either we're making energy from garbage or we're making energy from amazingness. And I would rather go towards amazingness. Okay, so leave the garbage behind, go to the good stuff and start going over there. In terms of working out, you know, listen to your body without doing any testing. Simple rule of thumb. Hey, can I work out? Typical question. Yes, you can. What should I do? See what your body does. Right, because stress is, if you're already stressed out all day, every day, Going in and doing a CrossFit workout may relieve stress during the event. Then afterwards, your adrenals are completely tanked, right? Or two days afterwards or a day afterwards, you're completely bedridden. You have no energy. Your body's completely tapped. And then you try and go to do workout again. So don't. So if you're like, what do I do? Just move your body 30 minutes a day. Get out and walk outside. Uh, it's fall in most areas. It's dropping into like the 80s and er, uh, low 90s, which is fantastic. It was chilly this morning. I had sweatpants and sweatshirt on. It's amazing. But what we're talking about isn't about the weather. <laughs> it's talking about the the diet and the lifestyle, right? So diets on point. Lifestyle, making sure that we have healthy exercise routine. Make sure you're not overdoing it or overtraining. Make sure you're getting rest days in, even if you think that you don't need rest days. Make sure you get rest days in. I have accidental rest days, which is where just I try to go to the gym every single day with the expectation that one or two days a week, I'm going to have to do something out of my normal, whether it's fi- fix an irrigation line or I'm draining my pool in the backyard. So I'm going to have to do that. So I'll probably miss the gym today or I'm getting my bow restrung. So I couldn't go to the gym yesterday, but then I forced it in. So it did work. Anyways, so <laughs> I digress. So You want to try to schedule that time for yourself every single day to do something outside of your norm. Usually it's some form of movement. For me, if I'm not going to the gym, like I'm working with the pool or I'm working with the irrigation line. So it's physical activity. I'm moving my body. I'm outside. I'm getting vitamin D. There's a bird on the fence there. Getting some vitamin D there and I'm feeling good. I'm feeling rejuvenated. Okay. So that's the easy stuff. Right now, the first coaching group that I was a part of didn't even say anything about that stuff. They were like, oh, they're stressed out. Deal with it. Take this herb, which now I'm looking back. I'm like, that's just allopathic. I mean, like holistic medicine, like allopathic, naturopathic stuff. Like, hey, I'm stressed. Here, take California poppy. Okay. Or, hey, I'm stressed. Take Kava Kava. And I used to practice that way. And, and we still got great results. Don't get me wrong. But the results we want are the lifelong, life-changing results. And that past organization, they, they lost it. I mean, there's, there's issues with just internally, like the guy was got in trouble for cheating on his wife. I think this is the second time that he cheated on his wife. You clearly have marital stress. So you can't try to teach other people about stress if you're not even able to fix or handle or deal with or whatever your stress, right? So we're missing this big piece, big, big, big piece. And that's what I started to experience. And that's what I've started kind of shifting into is this, it's this mindset, mindset reset. I guess maybe we can call that this episode that the mindset reset where we do an inventory. We, we do an assessment of relationships. What are your beliefs? What's your, your familial beliefs? What are your limiting beliefs? What is it that's getting in the way of you stepping into your, your purpose, your truth, right? Your alignment, because a lot of us wake up every single day. Angry, upset, depressed, anxious. And medically or allopathically, there's medication for that. 
right? Let's pop you on some Xanax. Let's give you some Prozac. Let's give you one of these mind altering drugs. So you have to pretend that you're not even here. It numbs you out to the world. So it eliminates one of your top senses. You're, you're, you're feeling, right? That's a big sense to, to have kind of shut off. And I know about that. I've had numbness in my hands and my arms, my legs. Like it's not fun, <laughs> kind of blunt and you're touching stuff. Like this doesn't work. So we've been there, right? So we've got that piece, okay? You wake up in the morning, you're feeling crummy, right? Boom, let's give you medication. You start to become fat, lazy, and even more depressed. And you're like, what's going on? Without first referring to that medication causing that, you jump on another medication or you jump on a weight loss diet or a detox that somebody's promoting. And that works for maybe a month. And you're like, hey, I lost 20 pounds. I feel great. Everybody should do this diet. And then all of a sudden, the next month, you put on 40 pounds. You're like, what the, what happened here? Right. And so, what I've been doing is diving into the mindset around weight. You know, I I tell people, like, I, I don't, my goal is to is not to make you lose weight. My goal is to make you as healthy as humanly possible. And a side effect of that is weight loss. There's patients who <laughs> who lose so much weight that it makes everybody around them very uncomfortable. Had a conversation with a, a young girl about this yesterday. And she's like, I think she said she's like 10 pounds away from like her, or no, she was 10 pounds from her, her pre-baby weight hit that. And now we're about to do a candida protocol. You're I'm like, you're probably going to lose five, 10 more. And she's like, oh. people are saying that I'm going to blow away in the wind. I'm like, well, most of that is an outward projection of their insecurity onto you. Right? So there's a mindset change on that. Cause my goal is to arm everybody that I work with, with a, with a perception filter, right? You run every word, every experience, every event through that filter. And what you do is you third party it or bird's eye view it. You're above it. It's happening for you, we have to figure out why or what is the experience? What is the lesson to be learned? How can I be greater after this experience has taken place? So we'll have people who want to lose weight, right? And I talked to a new friend of mine. I'm really excited. He's hopefully going to be jumping on a podcast with me, Jay Campbell. But you have to be in a place where you you love yourself enough and you feel worthy enough to step into your best physique or step into your best potential. And if you feel like you're doing it because you were called fat when you were a kid and you're still trying to prove yourself worthy to your parents, it's going to be a lot more difficult because it's external of you. It's it's outside of you. It's not within you, right? That the emotions within you, but you're trying to do something in the external, which is doing nothing for the internal. Because if you try to pretend that you're doing it to, to please your mom or please your dad, then what's going to happen is a friend or a boyfriend or a lover, whatever is going to come in and say the same thing to you in the, in the habit The pattern is going to keep repeating itself over and over and over again. And then what happens is we start to think in our brain that every time we go to lose weight, it's going to be difficult. I'm never going to be able to do it. Every time I try to, I don't get support. My spouse doesn't support me, which is a huge one. You know, there's there's all of these things that kind of intertwine into this. And if you don't pinpoint that underlying cause, that underlying stress of why you want to lose weight to begin with or have a strong why, it's going to be incredibly difficult to get to that end journey. If you look at yourself in the mirror and you see yourself as fat, lazy, ugly, I don't know, whatever the, the, the low emotions are, if you continue to do that, you tell yourself that every single day. It's auto-suggestion. Auto is self-suggestion. We're suggesting negative thoughts to ourselves. Go back to bullying, something I experienced greatly when I was a child. I mean, my name was Jock, for goodness sake. So Jockstrap was just like, uh, came right off the tongue for most people. And what did I do with that? My perception was I was insulted. I was embarrassed. I was weak. I was pathetic. I'm a loser. Like, and all of these things accumulate. What did I do with that energy? I put it into bodybuilding. And now I love bodybuilding. I am the healthiest I've ever been in my entire life. And maybe, maybe if I didn't get bullied when I was a kid, then I wouldn't be, it's possible. I wouldn't be where I am today, right? My first traumatic event. Well, I would say my first traumatic event was <laughs> getting locked in a uh, a pullout couch of one of those cots, right? We would play this game. Uh, my sisters and I would play this game called Kennywood, which if you're from Pittsburgh, you know what Kennywood is. If you're not from Pittsburgh, you would probably be afraid to go to this amusement park because it's pretty rickety. But we would just play a game and be like Kennywood. And there's no ride like this at Kennywood, but we'd shut them. Like I would shut the girls in the, the cot 
put them in there for like two seconds, pull them out, fold them out. And it was like, oh my gosh, that was fun. The adrenaline goes through the roof. Yay. So I wanted to experience that. And so I was bigger than my sisters. <laughs> I got in the cot and they threw me in there and I was stuck. <laughs> they could not get me out. So they had to go upstairs and disrupt my dad from napping, come downstairs and help to pull me out. He was pissed. We were all pissed about the situation. We couldn't believe it. And I didn't go back into a pullout couch. I don't think I've ever, well, I've never been back inside one, but I don't know if I've ever used one since maybe like once or twice. But so that made me very claustrophobic, right? And I still have, and I'm aware of it. I still have issues with being claustrophobic. You lock me in a closet or even if I watch a TV show and they're like crawling through like a little pipe or something to get from one side to the other, or like they're diving and I'm like, oh, this ocean's beautiful. And then they go in like this little crevice hole. I start to get anxious. I start freaking out. I'm aware of it. It's a low level, okay, in environmentally expressed stress. I know what it is. I can tune it back in. I can do some breath work. I can shut it off too. I can eliminate the experience. And I can just bring my, my body back to normal, and eliminate the stress, and I can process it. 15 minutes, done, easy, right? First trauma. Bullying was definitely going to be second trauma, for sure, because that was like forever. <laughs> I got beat up at the bus stop. My dad had to bust up a rock at the, at the bus stop because I cracked my skull on it. And then again, I got into bodybuilding. I got into football even more, got into just like hulking myself out. And then went to Penn State, or well, I went and played football, had some surgeries on my knees, so I, I got slow, ended up quitting football because I couldn't play anymore. Went to Penn State, graduated from there. Then I got jumped in 2009. That was another huge, huge, huge near-death experience trauma. I don't think that I should have lived through that event, but it was something that, that happened, okay? And talking about how this dictates our life, right? I can relate to a lot of people because of my experiences in life. In that moment, it's a stress. And I'm like, this sucks. Why is this happening to me? This is unfair, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, fat, fast forward, future pace of 10, 15, 20 years. And guess what? I'm able to relate to people now. Now, the claustrophobia thing, probably not as many people, but getting bullied, I understand that. I'm also protective with the kids, with the bullying and making sure they understand the power of their words. And that also plays into bullying in adult relationships. Right, because I can speak volumes to that. The words that you choose to use can either be blessings or curses to those that you love. So we want to make sure that we understand that. When I got jumped, I used to fight a lot. These things, these hands, I mean, I, I have them in reserve if I ever need them, but they're very good. And I'm very good at blocking pain receptors. Again, power of my subconscious mind. I can block pain receptors. I've had people hit me in the face and I didn't flinch. And that actually happened freshman year of college. And I, I ended up cracking a, a guy with my head. I, I head butted a guy and he didn't come outdoors for like three weeks afterwards. I used to be a really bad kid. I would get angry. I would fight. I would do all this stuff. And then I got jumped. And then from that moment on, it was a course correction, right? It happened for me. So I was able to course correct, change direction, and I haven't used my hands to hurt ever since. Okay. So I, I hung them up. I hung up the gloves, if you will. It happened for me. It's perception of what that actual environment or what that situation did for me. So if we can run everything through a perception filter and we can realize that it is external to us and we only we can only be hurt by the words and experience that we give value to, then we can really empower ourselves, right? And Stephen Jaggers and I, we talked about this on, on a previous podcast. Words only mean what you give them meaning right? I could say, I love love. And if, if somebody else says, I love love, they could be lying because love to them is cheating on their spouse or, or divorce or a rough marriage or whatever it is based off their previous experiences, right? So we have to go into it understanding what's happening. Now, with patients, what we're seeing, okay, is, and this is kind of across the board, there are some hidden traumas that are in their relationships, Okay, whether that's the parents were abusive when they were kids, or the parents never showed love and emotions, so therefore they never learned to show love and emotions. And what we're seeing is spousal causation. All right, so the other spouse is causing the other spouse stress, and they don't know how to handle that. 
So when I'm sitting here and I'm saying, well, we need to build an adrenal protocol because you have a phase three adrenal or phase two or phase one, whatever that, that is. And we've got the diet, we've got the lifestyle correct. And now let's talk about the relationship stuff, right? How are we communicating with each other? How are you expressing love? What is your love language? And we build from that. Love language is super easy. You can do a, a free quiz, figure it out. What is your love language? Super cheap, super easy to do. It takes you two minutes. Then you can figure out relationship assessment wise, have I been avoiding my spouse's love language? Mine is physical touch and probably words of affirmation. I don't know. I kind of go through everything like, yeah, just whatever. And my wife has hers words of affirmation here too. But again, we, we recognize that these love languages can and do switch because of different seasons in our lives. So do this quarterly if you want to, every couple months, just to do a check-in. You'll be able to tell. Once you know what the love languages are, you'll know what you're stepping further into. And sometimes you just need a little bit more physical touch for like a week out of the month. And then you need words of affirmation when you're going through a tough time. So it can be situational love languages too. Either way, we're assessing how that can be affecting your relationship. So example, if we see an adrenal test, Okay, and at four o'clock, you have boom, you have this giant spike in cortisol. Four o'clock every single day, boom, goes up super high, right? Allopathically, if I'm going to treat that, I'll give you some phosphatidylserine. Phosphatidylserine brings down that cortisol, makes it nice and easy to manage. We can do an adrenal protocol, but what's happening at four o'clock? Are you getting stuck in traffic? Is traffic god awful? If that's the case, let's bring in some good music for you to listen to while you're in traffic or a podcast. Listen to my podcast (laughs) while you're in traffic and just distract your mind to be a different place so that if somebody cuts you off, you're not going to lose your crap, right? And I used to listen to, well, I still do, listen to worship music like all the time in the car. It's either podcasts or like Elevation Church, some sort of sermon. It'll just be going in the car or Wayne Dyer's Moses uh, code meditation pops on every single time that I'm in the car, just auto syncs with the Bluetooth. And there you go. I've got meditation music to start. So it's tough to be angry or aggressive in a scenario where you're peaceful. You're listening to things that are peaceful. Now, if you're listening to death metal, if you're listening to the news or you're listening to really any type of pop and you're like, oh my gosh, so-and-so got divorced or Adam Levine is potentially cheating on his pregnant wife, I think. I don't know all the details, but oh my gosh, I'm distracted by that. How could he? And you got anger, 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 shame, shame, shame. You're throwing all these emotions and then you're going to be out of control. So from a functional standpoint, a true functional standpoint, we ask questions. What's happening at four o'clock? What's what's going on? Okay. Is it traffic? No, I work from home. Okay. When's your husband come home? When's your wife come home? 4.30. Are you fearful of the anticipation of your spouse coming home? Yes or no? No? Cool. Do you have kids? Yes. Kids coming home from school at four o'clock? Yes. What happens when the kids come home? Oh my gosh. It's it's chaos. They throw their stuff everywhere. They're yelling. They're screaming. They're asking for snacks. They're just going ballistic all through the house. They're making so many messes. I just cleaned the house. I can't even get there. Okay. Boom. There's the stress. You got it. We found it. Ding, 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 ding. We found it. Now let's extrapolate. We'll just use this as an example. Okay. So we'll say this is um, a guy is that I'm talking to. And the guy's like, I can't can't get these dang kids under control. It's, it's chaos. It's madness. I have no idea what to do. I just short circuit. I get angry. I yell. I scream. I become a version of myself that I don't like, right? Which I think pretty much every parent can relate to this. And then the question comes, well, what can we do to help support you, right? We can't, <laughs> we can't take your kids away. We can't be like, oh, sorry, kids. Go into the soundproof box and yell and scream and hurt each other. And there's Band-Aids in the corner. Like, <laughs> We can't do that. Now, some people may wish maybe like one day a week we can do like that, you know, put them in a straight jacket, let them go. That's called sports. Go put them in sports, let them run off that energy. But we have to figure this out, right? We can't eliminate the kids. That would be ridiculous, right? Kids are a blessing to us. We just have to figure out how to negotiate the beast of kids. So what else? Okay. So what is your state before the kids come home? Do you anticipate every single day? day. This is the routine. They're freaking maniacal. And you you expect that. You anticipate that every day. Guess what? You're going to be manifesting those events every single day. You're putting the energy out there. Think of energy like a boomerang. 
you're putting it out, it's coming back every day, same time. Okay. Now say, for example, we got a babysitter or your parents came and watched the kids. Four o'clock comes, kids aren't there. Guess what your body's still going to do? It will still produce the same amount of cortisol for the next little while because it's used to being stressed out at that time. All right. There's a memory. It's like muscle memory for your nervous system. It's crazy, right? Even if the stressor is taken away, you can still be triggered from a traumatic event. Now that's conscious. You're aware of that. Okay. What about if you're in that feeling, right? Kids are coming home, chaos every single day, and you have a spouse, right? Or or what if you're a single parent? We'll do spouse for right now. If you're a spouse right now, okay, or if you have one, then does the spouse help? Right. And there's there's a give and take in relationships where sometimes one spouse will help more than the other spouse, just kind of how things work. But that could be a stress that you're, you know, you take it out on your spouse or or your spouse takes it out on you. And we see this a lot of times in certain cultures that the women will be trying their best with the kids. And then the dads will come home or the fathers will come home. The husbands will come home and they don't understand the situation. And they're like, just get the kids under control. This is ridiculous, right? And then that stress then goes on the woman. And how are the adrenals supposed to relax in that state? How, how are the adrenals supposed to relax when that mom feels like she's getting attacked every single day from her kids, from her relationship? She probably feels that way when she goes to the store. She carries that stress with her. All day, every day. Moms, I can almost guarantee you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's these these expectations that have been put upon us. Certain cultures put a lot more stress on the women than others. Certain cultures will say that women really don't have a voice. They're supposed to do certain things at home, and that's their, their wifely duties, right? The gender rules that everybody hates. Stay home, cook, clean, take care of the kids. Go to sleep, repeat. Okay, or take care of the husband, right? And repeat. Doesn't always work that way, right? So, <laughs> so there are other, and I won't, I won't drop this one. I was going to say the other organization, something that this guy used to tell me all the time is incredibly freaking inappropriate, which is another reason why I left it. Well, he's, all right. he said that the women, the wife's job is to shut up and drain your sack. That's what he used to say, which is freaking disgusting. Anyways, so you have these types of dysfunctional relationships Okay, there's no communication, right? And then the kids are just going crazy. So you have spouse over here, spouse over here, chaos in the middle. Spouses can't communicate because there's chaos here, right? So then one has to step up in one area while the other, and it's like this give and take in a relationship, right? In a good way. Kids are going crazy, calm them down. The other spouse handles making dinner or taking the trash out, whatever whatever else, it doesn't matter. But we balance that. The point is, When we approach the cortisol rhythms from a functional standpoint, a true functional standpoint, we have to ask these questions, right? What if you come home and your husband abuses you, beats the crap out of you every single time that you come home to the point where sometimes you don't come home and that's a stress. It's a constant stress. Or what if it's you're laying next to your spouse who talks horrible? horrible about you to your face, to your friends, to your family, everything just horrible. And then you're expected to get into one of the most intimate positions, which is the same bed. You share the same energy in that bed and you're supposed to fall asleep. And you come to me and you're like, doc, I have insomnia. It's been happening for about five, six years now. I don't know what to do allopathically. We can give you phosphatidylserine, we can give you California poppy, we can give you CBD, we can give you THC, we can give you, you, I mean, there's so many things, insomnitol, like a melatonin, we could do all of these things. Do they work? Yes, absolutely, they do. They work at treating the symptom. But if the cause is still the fact that the relationship is dysfunctional, you're still going to be in a state of stress when you fall asleep. We're trying to force you to fall asleep, which is healthier than where you were, But if we don't ask the questions of what's happening at bedtime, then we're never going to know. We're never going to be able to get those end results. Because when we take you off of those those protocols, you need to be able to sustain that correction. 
And if we put you on something and then we take you off of it and you go right back into abuse, then your adrenals are going to go crazy and you're going to say the protocol didn't work. No, the protocol worked while you were on it, but the stressor still remained, right? It's like trying to say, um, I, I have a, a, a splinter, okay, in my foot and I just put a Band-Aid over top of it. I never pulled a splinter out at all and the splinter just keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper into my skin. And I'm like, nope, Band-Aid's there, Band-Aid's there, Band-Aid's there, Band-Aid's there. Month goes by, you're like, oh, I don't think I feel it anymore. Then two months go by, all of a sudden it's infected. And you're like, uh-oh, what happened? I put a Band-Aid on it and, and I took the Band-Aid off and it was still there. Like, what in the world? Well, you never removed the splinter. You never removed that thorn from your foot. The cause was still there. So it could be stress of the relationship, stress of the kids, stress of getting into the bed together and sharing that energy, not really knowing what the heck is going on. Or one that's even more common is people freaking hate their jobs. They hate it. Doc, I sleep phenomenal Friday and Saturday. I get the deepest sleep. I wake up with so much energy. I feel so good on Friday and Saturday. I'm like, great. What about the other days of the week? I feel terrible. I don't want to wake up. I'm depressed. I'm mad. I'm this. I'm that. You hate your job. I can't fall asleep at night. Are you fearful of what you have to do for work the next day? Yes. Okay. Do you like where you work? No, but it it pays the bills. It's a good paycheck, right? Or I've got five more years left to retirement. I'm sticking it out. Mom, if you're listening, (laughs) right? So these are stressors. These are things that happen on on a daily basis. And if we're constantly stressing ourselves out, it will be impossible for you to get your adrenals under control. And when we categorize the organ systems from the neuroendocrine, the GI to the the detox pathways, we have to understand that there is a cascade effect. They all become affected. When the neuroendocrine goes awry or goes chaotic, it's not just the adrenals and the hormones that are affected. Everything in the body is affected. It's impossible to think otherwise, right? Which again is a failure in allopathic medicine where it's like, oh, you have a heart blood pressure issue. Let's give you a blood pressure medication. Bullshit. It's not... I don't have a blood pressure issue. I hate my freaking relationship or I hate my <laughs> I hate my dog that wakes up at four o'clock in the morning and unfortunately wakes my wife up to, to have her like go out. No, we don't hate our dogs, but it could be something like that that does take place. And if we don't eliminate that cause, we're always going to keep that experience. And then once we eliminate that experience, we have to do something from a spiritual standpoint where we kind of fill in that void. Okay, this happens a lot in relationships. Okay, so couples that are together that are just boyfriend, girlfriend. Okay, boyfriend, girlfriend, and the girlfriend comes to me and is like, hey, I'm so stressed out. Every boyfriend I've had has done this. It's been this pattern all the time. This is all I'm good enough for. Like, I can't get a good guy because this is all I attract and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what bit? It is what you attract. That's your expectations. So when you become aware of those expectations of who you're bringing into your life, you then have to change and alter that. How are you going to change your thought process? Okay. So if it's, I always bring abusive men into my life, or I always bring in men who resemble my dad and I hate my dad, or I always bring in cheaters or whatever it is. Okay. You're aware of it now. Now, what would you like to change it to. If they're a cheater, I I gravitate and I bring towards me men who are of ethical uh, integrity, who are one woman men, who are serious in relationships, who are committed in relationships, et cetera, right? I'm bad with money. I used to be bad with money, right? I have abundance. I have all that I could ever need. Thank you for the abundance that I have, okay? Everyone like my dad, right? What are the characteristics of your dad? But what would you actually want instead of the characteristics of your dad, right? This is a Freudian thing that we do try to gravitate those things, but there are things that we probably would like about what we feel familiar with, with our, with our dads, but then how can we improve that? Because there's things about our dads that we wouldn't want as well. So there's all of these mental gymnastics that we do on a daily basis that a lot of us are unaware of. What are we bringing to, to us? What are we gravitating towards us? And where do we want to go? You know, a lot of us know what we, what we don't want, but we don't know what we do want. And if we spend all of our time and effort on what we don't 
want, we're giving that energy, we're giving it life. So therefore, we are creating that reality. Versus if we sat down for an afternoon and said, what is it that I want out of life? What is it that I want out of a spouse? What is it that I want out of a relationship or kids or whatever? And we write it down. And every single day you wake up and say, this is what my relationship is. This is what my relationship is with my kids. This is what my relationship is towards my family or towards friends or whatever it is. You have the ability to change that. You do. And we, we had an amazing conversation yesterday with one of my patients. She's one of my favorite patients, which I love all my patients pretty much equally. But this one is, is awesome because we, we just talked. And she was talking about how she stepped into her, uh, stepped out of her comfort zone. Okay. One of our mutual friends pushed her into an uncomfortable area. And for the first time in, I think, four months or so, she started using words and verbiage of self love. She said she was pretty, powerful, brave, calm. I mean, any complimentary word you can think of. And she was staring at herself in the mirror, which was amazing, right? Because it's the power of thought. And up until that point, she didn't feel as though she was worthy. She had some other things that we were working on. Yes, we're working on the gut. We're working on the adrenals. We're working on some other stuff. But from the mental standpoint, from the subconscious standpoint, we were trying to pull that stuff out and pull it to the surface. Okay, some of these things are things that we are consciously aware of, but then we become numb to, right? This is the best I'm going to get, so I just better get used to it. A lot of people say that, but we can also have those traumas that are deep, 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 deep in our bodies, in our subconscious mind that hide up into our nervous system. It could be the fact that I lost one of my favorite dogs. And if I didn't process through those emotions because I didn't have time to, it's like muzzle loading these emotions back into my body. They're going to get stored somewhere. Okay. What if it's uh, an abusive relationship that I had in the past, whether it was physically or mentally, I carry around those thoughts with me. If I never really get past that and and forgive and move forward, then what's going to happen? Muzzle load that in there until that, if that scenario comes back again, and you're like, I don't understand why this triggers me so much, but it does go back, find out how, find out why. And that's what Jaggers and I were talking about is that sometimes we need this, this somatic release, this somatic breath work, whether it's from Jaggers or, or my wife, Megan, they're trained, Megan trained with, with Jaggers, but we do this breath work technique that actually allows us to just purge those emotions from the past. It brings them up, which is amazing, All right? It's like, um, oh my gosh, oh my dad. It's like in Frozen, I think it's Frozen 2. When Olaf is walking through the woods and like, did you know that water holds memories and like all this other random stuff that he talks about. And then they're in the forest and then Elsa does some ice thing. I don't remember all the stuff. She does some ice thing and sees the frozen figures of her mom saving her dad from the North Aldrin, North North Aldrin. I don't know. Whatever that is. And it's like, Ooh, I didn't know that was there. Then they pull that memory out and like, wow. Okay. Water. We are water. We have impressions that are impressed upon us. So if we can purge it and become aware of it, we have to be mentally able to process it because some of this stuff can be very traumatic. That's why it's important to do breath work with a trained specialist on it. Otherwise, you can release some demons, which is not good, really like figuratively and and realistically. So we want to make sure that we have somebody that we trust to get us through that. But we can have these things. And that's a portion of, again, the, the care that we give in our office and and I'm quickly starting to call this the Moser method because I don't know anybody else that does this. They're stacking the functional medicine with the somatic breath work with some of this other stuff where it's like you have relationship coaching, you've got business. I've given, I've given business coaching too to patients because that's another stress in their life. Or I'll point out things where spouses are going in one direction and their business becomes a mistress because they don't know how to uh, communicate or handle their current stress at home. So they're going to displace themselves and go and try to conquer the world. And this happens all the time. It's like an entrepreneurial stressful thing, right? Where usually like when somebody opens a business or starts a business, it's one spouse going all in. The other spouse usually helps out as well, which is really like what Megan did. She helped me get this business off the ground and then some. And then we were able to, after we got through the initial years of stress, got rid of the the dead weight that was on us as well. And we moved on to, to greener pastures. Then we were able to work on communication again and bring it back to being, boom, hey, it's us. And now we've got kids, so now it's us and kids. Some entrepreneurs, they get through that initial bump, and then they look back and they forget about their spouse. 
or they've worked so much on the business that they don't have time for their spouse anymore. And then they're like, I don't know how to communicate. This makes me uneasy. Business is easy. I'm going to do more business stuff and I'm going to buy her more stuff to try to buy off this relationship to make it seem like I care, even though our love language isn't anything materialistic. She just wants physical touch, but I'm going to be over in, you know, overseas or some other state, country, whatever. It's like, well, you're sacrificing that relationship in there. So the spouse comes to me working on the adrenals. We talk about relationship and we're like, well, how are we going to make this work? This is where the stress started. It started five years ago, it started 10 years ago, it started when he got married, it started when he started this business. So we got to troubleshoot through that. Because I don't want people to be on supplements for the rest of their life. And that's one of my biggest pet peeves too is like, again, I can treat people all day. I can make you stoned to Jesus. I can't, I can't make you, but I can tell you, go get a bunch of weed, smoke your face off every day, and your problems will go away, right? Well, you'll have bills to pay still, but your problems will go away because you won't even be aware of it. You, you will be completely numb to the world all day, every day, right? Or, or for the rest of your life. Or I can say, listen, I see what you're doing here, okay? Because some people do. They'll use THC every night to go to sleep. Sometimes it is medicinal. It does help them to fall asleep. A lot of entrepreneurs will do it, and I understand that. But then there's others who are like, I hate my spouse, so I'm going to smoke weed, or I'm going to do 48 edibles at the same time so I can sleep, okay? There is usually a reason. There's usually an underlying cause for what is actually going on. Right? You need to shut your body down at the end of the day because your brain is bop, 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 and you've got cortisol going crazy. What's the cortisol going crazy about? Is it because you didn't prepare for the next day? Right? Is it something to have to do with that? So again, I'm giving you so many, so many random examples out there because I'm seeing, I'm seeing more and more of it, helping more and more with it. And I think that it's important to note that when you do work with me, it's not everybody that has to go through or gets to go through this process, but it is something, it is a tool in my tool belt to make sure I have the skills to be able to help you process through some of these things. And then if I don't have the skill set, because I'm not a, a, a licensed therapist or anything, if I don't have the skill set, I have the people in my utility belt to refer you to, to help. And that's something that has been tremendous, right? I have multiple business coaches I can send entrepreneurs to. Whether it's Anthony Trucks, Johnny L. Sasser, like they're, they're, those are my people. If it's speaking, public speaking, I usually send people to Roberto Monaco, who helps chiropractors. He helped me learn to speak. Even Anthony Trucks is great at learning how to speak and communicate. Right? What about sex coaching? Sex Love Co. Go see Alexa or one of the, the trained professionals that she has on there. Right? What if it's just overall therapy? You need a therapist. Well, we got people for that. What if it's a pelvic therapist? Well, I'm going to send you to Thrive Health, right? So there's Thrive Pelvic Health. So I have all of these skill sets I have accumulated, but then knowledge of having people in my in my court or my round table, if you will, to be able to say, hey, this and so-and-so, you're my professional in this area. Please help this person out. And it's amazing, right? Oh, and a PT. So Dr. Matt uh, Zanis, like I've got him. So I've got social media. I've, I've got somebody for everything, which is like this past year has been such a blessing with making phenomenal connections. Like Regina Lawrence does my, my uh, media stuff. The good in media is going to do my, my podcast editing. So, and Kenzie, Kenzie from heart creative does my, my video shoot. She's doing a Friday. Like I've got something for everyone. <laughs> so, so whether you're an entrepreneur or you're just, um, you're just a normal person who's just trying to navigate this world, navigate this life and trying to have your best experience possible. You know, I've seen and I've dealt with a lot of stuff and I've tried to pick the best people that I can refer to, okay? Now, I'm not going to send you as a referral to like a, a GI doc. I'm not going to send you to a PCP. I'm not going to send you to an endocrinologist. I'm not going to send you to an oncologist. I'm not going to send you really any other doctor. Uh, and the reason I won't do that is because I don't believe in the way that they practice. And censor me all you want from it, but I'm here to get people healthy. I'm not here to get people on medications. And it's simple as that. Here to help people get healthy enough that they can tell their docs that they don't need the medications anymore. The doc retests them. Oh shit! Yeah, you're right. Okay, and that's again one of the things with how you're doing, right? Like birth control. Birth control will alter who you're attractive to, women. So if you're on birth control and you got married on birth control, and then you come off birth control, then you look at your spouse and you're like, I don't like this. This guy, what is this? This is not, no, I don't like this at all. 
And the doctor will say, oh, well, you, you've got antipsychotic, antidepressants, we'll put you on that, right? Let's numb you out instead of saying, hey, sorry, this birth control altered how you perceive him and now you don't like him and you're stuck in that relationship for the rest of your life, right? There's so many causative factors in what we do on a daily basis. And I keep seeing myself sliding. The, the protocols are so easy for me to build. When I meet with my patients, I prep, go through the notes. I already have the protocols built. I know typically what I want to talk about. I have typical questions that I talk about. How often do you poop? How are you feeling? How are you sleeping? How are you eating? How are you exercise? And those typical things. And then we'll, when we go into the stress, we'll go back and I'll comb through notes and say, hey, your homework last time was to lay out the top 10 limiting beliefs. Or your homework was to do relationship assessments. Give me a triggering situation where you and your spouse got into an argument. Give me percept, uh, perspectives on each side. We'll meet on that. And we'll schedule a half hour. We'll go over that. Right. So we, we dissect this stuff and we keep doing it time and time again. And it just becomes so ingrained in, in patient care, whether it's in the beginning, we talk about the relationship being damaged or when we fix the gut or we fix the pain points and then the pain's no longer there. And now you're sitting there staring down the barrel of your relationship. And you're like, well, how do we navigate this? And we help with that. Right. And our goal is not to split people up. Our goal is to bring people together. Right. Because I feel like you got together for a reason whether God put you together, whether you felt you know emotionally connected to that person, there was a reason that you met your soulmate, okay? There's a reason. And if something happens in the between, in the in between, we have to figure out what that stress is, right? That's all it is. It's a stress. Figure it out. Figure out how to communicate again and come close, right? Remember back on the good times. Remember what it took. It took work. It took energy. Nothing good ever happens with neglect, right? Nothing gets better except wine and whiskey, that's the, <laughs> the only two things, uh, or bourbon or scotch, I guess. But still, alcohol aside, nothing gets better with neglect. Plants die, houses fall apart, right? Cars fall apart, everything falls apart, landscaping falls apart. So, when, where we feel that we have stresses are, are often not where the stresses are truly coming from. I need help getting pregnant. I see this one a lot. I need help getting pregnant. Okay. How's your relationship? Oh, well, you know, I've, I've worked with people and I've, I've denied people care where they're basically saying, hey, I want to have a kid so that they can save their marriage. Like buying a puppy would fix their relationship. Mm -mm 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 -mm. No. No, no, no. There's a reason why you're not bringing life into this world. Your relationship is, is horrible. Why would I bring in a kid into, a, into an abusive relationship? I don't want any part of that. Go go somewhere else. I'm not, I'm not having it, right? Because it doesn't work. What if somebody comes to me and you're like, doc, I want to have a kid. Top issue is I have chronic fatigue. I have no energy at all. My suggestion would then be, well, don't think about having a kid quite yet. You need to get your adrenals back online because if your adrenals are taxed, how the hell are you going to sleep at night? And how are you going to have energy to raise a kid? And then you're going to lead into postpartum depression. Then you're going to have issues with your relationship because your stress is going to be displaced on your spouse and it's going to crash everything. That kid will crash everything. You're not ready yet. Okay. Not that you're not worthy. You're just not ready yet. Don't, don't rush into it. Fix it. Figure it out. What if somebody comes to me, which happens, and they've tried IVF for two years, three years, whatever, however long they've been trying that journey, PCPs, endocrinologists, like bioidenticals, they, they tried everything. They come to me like, hey, I want to get pregnant. And we talk about stress response and they just start bawling their eyes out. What happened? Every month that I've tried, 12 months in a row, I've miscarried every single month. 12, 12 failures, 12 dead tries. Okay, trying to be as abrasive as possible because that's when you get the diagnosis of being infertile. You have to go 12 months without being able to get pregnant. You fail 12 times. Okay, say somebody miscarries all the time, then what's going to happen? Every single time they get pregnant in the back of their mind, if we don't pull this out in the back of their mind, they're going to anticipate having another miscarriage. Okay, because the body is programmed to, this is a routine, right? I get pregnant, I lose it. I get pregnant, I lose it. I get pregnant, I lose it. We have to break that cycle or it's going to continue to manifest. Fix the stressors, bring love back to your body. Bring trust, trust back to your body and also work on that relationship. Because when we do infertility work, 
both spouses are affected. And if communication wasn't good before that journey, it's not going to be good after. Okay. Because you're not going to be able to, to, to tell the truth. People are going to be hiding things. It's going to be a whole bunch of disconnect or dis-ease between the spouse. And again, if we're trying to fix the adrenals and we never ask those questions, what's going to happen? The same shit over and over again. But this time we're talking about life. All right. Bringing life into this world. So there's so many, I'm going to say it again, so many intricacies in this line of work that is very unique and very different compared to any other doctor that you've been to. I, I can guarantee it. Whether you've found somebody else that calls himself a naturopathic health expert, or you found somebody that I've worked with, in the, <laughs> I'm joking, or you found somebody I worked with in the past, or someone who did a, a, a two-day seminar, or, or a CE, a continuing education credit, and like, hey, I can do this now too. No, you can't. This is eight plus years of, of deep dives into relationships. And I would even go further and say, this is, I'm, I'm going to be 36 this year, 36 years of experience that I've accumulated that shows I was called for this purpose because I can work through these scenarios. I've been through a lot of these scenarios and I've been out on the other side. I know what it's like to be down in the dark. I know what it's like to have no sleep at night and have negative depressive thoughts. I know what it's like to feel like your relationship is over with your spouse. I know what it's like to, to go through so many stresses. I know mold toxicity. I know low testosterone. I know how to compete in bodybuilding. I know how to, <laughs> the list goes on, right? I know how to do a lot of things, but those experiences aren't designed to make me brag. Those experiences are designed that I can say, oh, wait, I don't know why I feel called to bring this portion up, but in boom. And I throw it out there. And that, that feeler of me throwing it out there opens up that patient. And the patient's like, oh, my God, I don't know how you knew that. Or I had one say, like, oh, are you, did you bug my phone? I think I had two patients this week say that. I'm like, no, it's just what I felt. I intuitively felt that. One of which was um, the patient I talked about yesterday saying, I, I can almost sense if they haven't already that when you come and you show up, people are going to notice that you look different, you're showing different, you're, you're a different version of yourself than you ever have been. She was like, actually, they did that yesterday. I'm like, yeah, of course they did, right? So I, I am intuitive in this stuff, which is another thing that makes it really difficult to coach it because I, you, know, you, have to, you have to be able to be intuitive, but you also have to fix yourself first so that you can be intuitive enough that your own emotions, your own feelings, your own physical ailments aren't getting in the way of you perceiving what's actually going on. And this just happens over a phone. I don't even do Zoom, Zoom calls all the time. I don't. Usually it's, it's just phone calls. And I'm able to sense that over the phone. I'm able to feel emotion over the phone. I don't know many docs that can do that. And honestly, I don't know many docs that care to. They're just, hey, how can I see as many people as possible and get as big as humanly possible and make as much as humanly possible? And I don't care how many bodies I have to step on to get there. That's unfortunately the mentality of a lot of people out there. A lot of people that I've met, a lot of people that I've worked with, which again, I am proud of myself and prided myself last year on finding the best people. And I'm still continuing to do it. I'm still continuing to add to my arsenal of people to refer to because we're able to build this amazing network. We're able to share our own, our own experiences and our own protocols and procedures with each other. And it's so unique. And it also helps me because I can only do so much. <laughs> I can, even the emotional thing. It, it was tough for me at first because I absorbed a lot of it and then I would, I would not know how to process through it and then I would take it out on my relationship. Not abusive, but like if something very depressing happened and I would come out of the office, I'm like, oh, my energy's different. I'm low, don't wanna eat. I don't really feel like going to the gym today. I, oh, the kids did what? Okay, yeah, I just don't have energy right now. I just, I don't know what's going on. I just feel kind of depressed. Right. And, and honestly that happened. Like those things, those conversations have happened with, with Megan. Like, I just don't feel like myself. I feel horrible. Like I, I don't, I don't have that energy. Like I usually do. It's not fun. I don't really want to do anything. I just want to lay down, which if I ever say, I just want to lay down, that's a sign that something's wrong. Right. And again, clinically speaking, if Megan was my clinician, she would say, Oh, you sound like you have depression. Let's get you an antidepressant, right? But she would never do that. We talk about it. We communicate. She was able to help me pull some of this through. I've got crystals and stuff around my office to try to help block some of the, the energy absorbance. Yes, I have those. Oh, proof. <laughs> but it took me time to get that 
resiliency to be able to absorb and release. Okay, I've actually, we paid people to help coach me through that too, where it was like, hey, you got to put on a wall. I've had people say, you got to act like you've got gloves on, um, which was when you were, well, when I was adjusting, like put gloves on so that way you're not absorbing the energy. Just visualize that or bracelets to visualize that it blocks or it stops at the, the hands and you release it, you shake them out afterwards. But it's like real stuff. And it, and it helped. And again, this is trial and error through this stuff. But again, this is, I'll just, I'll just end with this. If you've been with other docs, if you're hesitant, if you're curious, if you're like, what the heck are you talking about? How do you do this stuff? Then just schedule a call with me. Give me an hour of your time. And we'll have one of the deepest conversations I can almost guarantee you've ever had. We'll go back to your childhood. We'll go back to whether you were breastfed. We'll go back to traumas. We'll go back to living environments. We'll, we will accumulate every experience over your lifetime that you're comfortable you know, sharing. I'm not going to force people to talk or communicate about it. You ask permission before you dive deep. Okay. It's really important. And then you, you see where it goes and we get some testing. And then usually we gain some trust from that. And the patient will say, well, I know that we were talking about this last time, but I did some more thinking and I think it was actually coming from this or this previous relationship where this guy said this about me, where he hated the way that I looked or, you know, I only used to lose weight because it would make my boyfriends happy. Not make you happy, but make my boyfriends happy. And so you don't want to lose weight because it's just this, this toxic mentality that just keeps looping itself. But if you've gone through this stuff or with other people and you're like, I don't know how to get results, schedule a call with me. Bring these questions. Bring as many as you want. And we'll dive as deep as you want to or, just, or as deep as you feel comfortable diving. Because I'm here for you. And I want you to be the best version of yourself because I feel like that's what we were called to do. So we were called here. Why we were called here? To make change on this earth. And if there's something in this physical realm that is stopping you from being able to express your spiritual self, there is something in the way that we need to figure it out. That's what I do. So call me a naturopathic health expert. Call me a chiropractor. Call me a healer. Call me whatever you want. I'm Doc Jock. And that's... I guess how I'm going to go for it right now. That's about it. So that being said, thank you for listening today. Uh, I know it was long. I know it was a little bit dragged out there with this different situations and scenarios, but I wanted you to kind of see, you know, it's not just building these protocols to help with certain symptoms. Okay. It's not just building protocols to help to, you know, get pregnant or avoid mold toxicity or, or get rid of mold toxicity or fix your gut. We're talking about life changing results now and then in the future. So that being said, take care and have a super awesome, amazing, blessed day.